Welcome to This Week in Perspective with me, Adam Simbe. The fifth phase administration is now just about nine months old. Uh, so I thought it's pertinent to review the status of our economy and inflation, uh, two important um, elements in our development. The Bank of Tanzania says, despite external challenges due to um, and even global growth, the country's microeconomic benchmarks are expected to remain strong. To discuss this and other related uh, issues uh, today with me are uh, Professor Amon Mbele from the Department of Economics, University of Dar es Salaam, Dr. Blandina Klama from Repoa, uh, Policy and Research and Development, whatever, I should explain the long term, I've always used Repoa. Uh, Dixon Ephraim Leba from uh, the Central Bank, but is head of macroeconomic research yes, and policy. And, policy. and Professor Haji Semboja, again from the Department of Economics, University of Islam. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the program. Thank you very Thank you. much. Thank you. The two professors are pioneers of this program, but you have participated for the first time and for the first time, so I wish to welcome you. Most thank you. Okay. And, and I'm glad for you to, to, to have uh, accepted to attend Blandina because you have helped me to to remove the gender imbalance that has been uh, troubling me for the last three, four, four programs. So, ladies and gentlemen, once again, welcome to the program. Okay. I hope we'll do justice to the topic. I will start with Professor Bailey. What is the status of the economy? nine months into the fifth phase administration. Yeah, according to some of the reports from the central bank and other uh, stakeholders who are following, there have been no major shocks in the, in the economy, contrary to what uh, usually happens when there is a regime shift, because economic agents would always want to play it safe, uh, wait and see what, are the, what policies will come, what policies will be continued, so in most cases you find shocks that would really disturb the economy but uh, fortunately it has been sort of tranquil in terms of both the macroeconomic balances and so forth but of course the greatest challenge is in poverty uh, poverty is not uh, being reduced at the rate that is expected so probably that's the area where uh, a lot of challenge uh, is confronting the, the fifth phase government, the, the link between the macro and the micro. And the, 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 we need some grasp on it. Okay. Um, the, the, the player, the major players in any economic uh, growth or development, as it were, as you said, uh, the usual wait to see whether there's certainty in the, in the policies of the incoming administration or not. Is this still the case for us? I would say to some extent that's the case. Okay. Professor Simbogi, what your take what your take on this? Um, I, I do agree that uh, we have a, a macro economic stability at the moment. Yes. Well, we can measure that one using the inflation rate, which is uh, controllable about uh, five percent which is lower it's, uh, we look at the uh, rate of economic growth which is about uh, seven which is expected um, hopefully that uh, with the current regime the government financing is uh, properly controlled um, you heard the Bank of Tanzania have been very capable of controlling the money supply uh, all these point to the direction that at the macro level we are doing fine. How about at the micro level? But then comes to the question um, at the micro, particularly the performances of these very important microeconomic activities, small scale uh, households, companies, uh, all these ones in the private sector. Uh, have some cases, some cases, problems related to the lack of effective government demand. I will explain that one um, 
Pero by saying that uh, there are started complaints uh, that uh, the government has not uh, concentrated its efforts in supporting the, 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 the private sector by the fact that uh, they, have they have started not using the services which have been which are provided by the private sector, in particular the, the, the servicing sector, especially the house, the uh, hotel and hospitality sectors. Or conference halls. Yes, so the government <laughs> is not using those hotels. Of course, it's, it, it's one, it, it is one of the ways whereby the government can control the expenditures. We, the government has had many seminars, workshops, meetings held outside the government premises. So the plan now is to make sure to optimize those public resources, which is fine on one hand, but on the other hand we have a problem because already the private sector, based on the previous consumption pattern of the government, yes. managed to expand the sector. Mm -hmm. So we have hotels now complaining about that lack of government effective demand. Okay. Do, do you think this uh, situation persists? Particularly for the private sector, I mean, and in, in reference to the hotels, which you, they've been complaining that they're not doing business because of this decision not to utilize uh, private sector public hotels, the big hotels for conferences which are organized by the government. Now, let me try to generalize this point. I can understand the reasons why the government uh, is, is, uh, is moving towards that direction. Yeah. Uh, there are good reasons. I mean, one is to control those seminars and costs, which are, to some extent, some of them are not uh, cost effective. Yeah. But uh, in general, we have to understand the relationship between the economies of the private sector and the public. About, I can say, about 70 to 80 percent of the government public procurement yeah. you know, of goods and services, they have to come from the source, from the private sector. So the government is a very important stakeholder for, for, the, for the private sector. And, and the private sector is also very important for the government. Because, I mean, take, for example, for this case, uh, if you constrain the private sector, pr precisely the, the servicing sector, the whole sector, the whole se sector, all it means that uh, you'll have less uh, employment opportunities. So they have... Which to means they, they they some have of these private sector hotels will be will forced have to, to retrench, I suppose. Isn't it? To retrench, to, reduce, to uh, close businesses mm -hmm. and will not have uh, this uh, multiple effects okay. to the society. Right. People will be losing jobs, losing incomes, mm -hmm. and the government will not get the, the, the desired taxes which they originally had planned. Okay. But, uh, but uh, I think uh, there are other things which you have to look on the side of the government because uh, the government is taking good measures uh, in the taxation area. Um, good control in terms of reducing efficiencies, corruption and thefts. Now this one promises a possible increase in the government coffer. So we are, we are anticipating that uh, because you, you see our economy, the way the government is operating is cash budget. Uh, at the moment, we will feel that no enough resources which are flowing from the public to the government, to the, to the, to the private. But in the second round, maybe after three to six months to come, we should be expecting now the government to have a good balances in its coffers so that they can now plan to consume and hire the private sector for certain services. Okay. So we should expect that one. All right. Um, I'll turn to you, Dr. Um, <coughs> you heard Professor Mbele saying, as far as macroeconomic uh, performance, we're doing very well. But he wasn't so sure about the microeconomic uh, performance because of the issues of poverty. Now, uh, you're an economist as well as a researcher uh, on issues of poverty. Why is it that we can still not balance between macro and micro economic performance which supposedly leads to poverty levels not 
being very appreciative in terms of growth. Okay, uh, thank you very much. Um, I agree with the, some of the interventions made by the previous uh, speakers. The one thing that, that adds on into the discussion is when we're talking about the macro level interventions or when we're talking about the economy of Tanzania, let's say we have agriculture, industry and services as rightly pointed out. Now, if you ask where are the people, and once you talk about people, then you will know whether where people are engaged, that's where you're having impact. So uh, the employment figures show us we have majority of Tanzanians in the agriculture. But the macro picture is agriculture is contributing less, the share of agriculture into GDP is less than 30%, around 30%. Now, if you are having nearly 70% of your population engaged in agriculture, but their contribution is only 30%, then comes the question, oh, why is poverty not decreasing? Because what, already... What would be the mitigating <coughs> factors in the yes. so many engaged in the agriculture, but their contribution to GDP is just about 30%. What are the mitigating factors? So the productivity of the people engaged in agriculture is very low, and that uh, leads to that. But then at the same time, the sectors that are growing, fortunately or not so fortunately, is they tend to engage people with uh, needed high quality skills, the likes of industry, yeah. where you find like communication has been growing. Yeah. But if you ask how many people can be employed in communication, it's just a handful. If you move again into services where you're having a lot of people also being uh, uh, employed there in terms of wholesale and uh, retailers, the question will be what is the quality of employment these people are engaged in? And then all of us maybe will go back and say we would want to have more people employed in the industry because not only uh, the type of work that these people will be engaged in will be better off, but it will be sustainable. If we say everybody uh, is into services and they're trading, if there is no trade, like the examples that were uh, already shared, then they will be hit so hard. But if they're engaged in a specialized uh, skill, then at least even when there is a shake, they can switch to something else. And that, I think, is the, is the dilemma that Tanzania is facing. For instance, when uh, some of the studies that have been undertaken they show the area that is growing so much, that is the, the bits in industry and services. If you focus just within the industries, this is where you have the mining, uh, this is where you have construction. Unfortunately, telecommunication. Yes, and telecommunications is also there. Unfortunately, once you start zooming in, our integrated labor force survey data is showing us the people who are engaged in, the majority of them go in informally. So already, not only are you trying to have a lot of people who are in agriculture to get better decent work, you also want the people who will be engaged in the industry also to have decent work. And somehow we're struggling to do that. But then now with the second five-year development plan, already we're making plan to use that. So that's a good start, saying we're going into industrialization. So it's not just having um, industrialization, but rather taking on board all the people who are in agriculture that we're saying our economy is leaving them behind, engaged with an agro-processing, or, or engage in some <coughs> decent work, then we will see. It. How about improving S their productivity in the land? Exactly, exactly. So if they are engaged in those, those value addition, looking at all the different uh, nodes of the chain, so not just saying agriculture and then we leave there, or let's say I've worked in cashew, not just saying cashew and we leave there, but no. It means it's very important we not only focus on the farmer, but we also focus on the, on the stakeholders who are, pro are providing different uh, inputs to these farmers. And then we're not just talking about uh, a farmer who is dealing with like subsistence, but we're talking about a farmer who is ready to grow. Because the farmers who are not ready to grow. And so we will have to think about really hard is how are we going to accommodate them, not really creating constraints for them to grow, but creating an environment oh, can where we turn they can them grow. into commercial farmers, for example. Yes. Does that have an added advantage? Yes, because um, as you rightly point out, as long as you will aim to increase their productivity, yes. 
then you will see improvement. But then now the next discussion will be, uh, and we hear this a lot, uh, it's a debate in Tanzania. For instance, I'll, I'll give an example. This year, let's say, we depend a lot on rain. Uh, was it last year we had a mm -hmm. pampa harvest and it means it, yes. So last year, the same plot of land, people got a lot. Meaning, easy economics, too much supply, the price is going to go down. Yeah. Easy economics, sell, you did not do anything. It just happened, you have to sell. But then if you have a debate that goes like, no, 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 because you sell, I mean, since you got a lot of harvest, you must be paid high. Then the question is, where will the money come from? It's exactly the same land, it's exactly the same inputs. So when we are talking about increasing productivity, if we look at the examples from Asia and elsewhere, what they're saying is, this needs to bring about reduction in cost of producing things. At the end of the day, when we're talking about industries and we're able to reduce this cost, it means either the industries can operate sustainably, let alone all the other challenges they have, because labor is one of the things, and your labor has to eat. Only if they can eat cheaply, then you can see uh, a more uh, multiplier. Before I come to you, Dixon, um, there was a saying in the past, which I think is still being said in many different ways, that we Tanzanians are more or less consumers than producers. Does this rub you? I mean, on the basis of what you've done, I mean, in your research, and how do we get over this, being just consumers and not producing? That's and yet we want to become a, a, a middle-income economy in a couple of years, not a couple of years, but at least very soon. Mm -hmm. um, that's a good point, um, and it's really relevant to us. Just because we call ourselves consumers, it doesn't mean we're not producing. Yeah. It just means we're not producing enough to turn to the other side to be called the, 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 produ the producers. And now as we aim to become a middle income country come 2025, this is going to be very, very relevant. Some of the good examples that were shared here by Professor Samboja indicates to that direction. So even when we think about consuming, we have to consume sustainably. It's not just about consuming anything that is coming from you, but there should be rewards out of it. There should be people um, um, uh, uh, rewarded out of the system. But if you're not, then you will be, uh, you will be left behind. Now, um, and the holistic approach on how the, the, the entire economy works is really, really important. If we just uh, do piecemeal, we pick this and we ignore all the other part, then no, it's not going to work. And uh, and I believe, I mean, we'll have to hear from the others, but I believe that would be the greatest um, challenge. Uh, I wouldn't want to call it a challenge. I love challenges. So <laughs> you don't have a challenge, then there isn't a reason you want to wake up in the morning. I think it will be, a, a, yeah, it will be one of the, yes, but something that we have to sort out. Oh. Yeah, it will be a challenge oh. that we will have to sort out. All right, yes. thank you, Brandina, for that. Um, Dixon Lemon, you're head of micro economic Monitoring financial affairs and uh, economic research and policy. All right. Yes. Um, it's the bank which is saying we're not doing badly. Exactly. Are we not doing badly? Yes, thank you. Uh, when looking at the numbers and uh, generally looking at the performance of the economy so far, yes. as uh, clearly pointed out by Professor uh, Simboja, uh, the leading indicators even for the first nine months of this fifth year government, uh, we see the growth in electricity generation for instance because that's an indicator that shows you that there are coming up some activities in our economy even looking at the cement production cement production is picking up uh, for the first quarter the numbers that we have now is growing at 6.6 percent and uh, another thing is on the uh, the revenue the revenue that has has performed fairly okay for the past nine months, which government is what collecting you say revenue, what you mean? Uh, collection? revenue collection, the actual flows on average, okay. which is about 1.2 trillion a month for the first nine months of the fifth. Has it been stable this time? 
Uh, well, it varies depending on the quarter because the substantial amount in December, for instance, we collected about 1.5. But uh, other months you find is 1, 1 trillion, 1.1, uh, 1 1.3 in March, which is quite, quite, quite significant in support of the initiative that the government uh, is pursuing. But another thing is uh, looking at the monetary data, yes. credit growth, because credit growth goes to the private sector. And that one has been growing on average for the first eight months up to June. Yes. Uh, it has been growing on average of about 22%. Mm -hmm. Of course, some months you find it's 19, 16, but on average, that's, that's an indication that things are not bad mm -hmm. and the economy is on track in general. And uh, just to share with you for the first quarter of 2016, uh, the economy has grown by 5.5%. Uh, driven again by agriculture. Much lower agriculture than the this time project. around has, uh, compared to last year, mm. it was 5.7, but uh, it's not significantly different from that. And agriculture this time has contributed above 10%. Around above 10%? 3. Yes. Not, not, uh, not yet reached the 30% uh, uh, that I was talking about. <laughs> <laughs> this is for the first quarter right, because okay, for okay. the thirty percent she was talking about this for the entire year. <laughs> for the entire year. <laughs> so it's uh, it's uh, it's uh, something that we need to be proud of the the way we have been uh, performing so far. And I think uh, given the initiative of the fifth phase government yes. in trying to uh, harness the industrial revolution, yes. uh, coming up with human capital development which will be targeted specifically in addressing our problems. Uh, I think we, we are going, going to perform fairly okay in the medium term. And there are also issues uh, related with the ongoing projects, for instance, uh, construction of the gas pipelines, the oil pipeline from Uganda to Tanga, all those drives and the uh, construction of the central, central yeah. railway lines to standard gauge. We expect all those will steer up activities uh, one thing I want to share maybe in this uh, particular session is an issue of uh, private sector trying to come up with uh, a changing game plan. We used to be to depend a lot on uh, cash flow from the, from the central government. That the government must spend for the private sector to... to we is understand the government, the, the, government, yeah, the government is, the is, is the a giant player. Up, government is a giant player indeed, but uh, given the changing... Uh, Changing, I mean, changing. I mean, the economic situation that we have, the way the government is coming up with uh, measures that input, uh, putting in management of the expenditures, the revenue efforts that they are taking, the private sector now has to fit in to see how they are going to play the game moving forward. You, 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 you referred or you talked about um, um, government improving. Revenue collection, yes, uh, which is is impressive so far. Um, but uh, does it really match in the few uh, months that the administration has been in power? Does it <coughs> match with the expenditure? I raise this because you might also react to this. I I was a bit puzzled when the World Bank, no, not the World Bank, the International Monetary Fund (IMF) was saying, was actually asking the government to be very prudent in the expenditures list the gains are affected is it is this fair what, what the government has managed to collect so far yes. i would say it's a good progress mm. but we can collect more mm. we can actually collect more and uh expenditure that the government has been because they usually have a monthly ceiling meetings mm. looking at the available resources both from within and outside and uh, they plan the expenditure accordingly and uh, mostly which has been channeled to uh, recurrent partly and uh, development yes. de development expenditure. Yes. Uh, I would say, well, there is a gap from what we collected on average of about 200, uh, which is again 200, uh, 200, I mean, uh, 200 billion shillings. Yeah, yeah. Okay. That is what, in, in a month? Or? It, it varies. Month on month it varies. In okay. some months it's very low. Like in last June, yes. the government collected about uh, 1.6, but uh, I mean July, 1.1 uh, 1. 1 something, and then they spent uh, about 700 mm. million. So they, would, they had a net saving. 
but we, we wish that they could spend more because yes. we need that in the economy. <laughs> uh, regarding the, the the judgment by the IMF, I think they are referring the the issue of uh, building the standard gauge railway with oh, the 7.6 yes. with the 7.6 yes. billion dollars. Yes. That uh, given the absorptive capacity of the economy, yes. we need to be cautious on that. But that that's a, it's a tanky project. So the the amount that will come will be spent accordingly, mm. and most of that will be in form of equipment. It's not like cash that can lead to economy being uh, overheating or. Yeah. But a standard gauge uh, railway line from Dar es Salaam to Kigoma and Mwanza. Uh, as opposed to what we have now, which is almost a cake built by the Germans, the Mwanza to the Tabora to Mwanza was built by the British, uh, will, will boost the economy. Is that true? Yes, that's very true. That's you'll be, you'll true. be able to transport a lot of goods by by train rather than by road and killing our roads, and then you go back to the yeah. infrastructure problems. Is that right? Yeah, that's, that's very true. And the, given the form of financing now mm. that's coming in for that project is, uh, is quite healthy for the economy, unlike if it was a loan. A loan, a loan you know, will lead you into a problem of servicing it because building a standard gauge railway, the cash flow will come up slowly. So you might end up uh, in an issue of uh, currency mismatch. That's why uh, doing all these projects, again, the issue of how we are going to finance them is, is quite important. Like what we are doing for the central railway line, that's perfect. I see. And that we'll will see it is steering okay. our economy. We'll, we'll, we'll come back to the to the servicing of external data later on. But Professor, uh, you, you know the, the the IMF World Bank on the, the POT report. There was a question of um, um, the domestic microeconomic environment, which they say is very stable. Now, are there risks if it's not stable? Yeah, there are a lot of risks when you have uh, an economy functioning in a way that's not predictable. <laughs> so predictability, I think, is key to, 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 to the actors acting rationally and in a predicted way. So if there is anything that we have to guard against, is a... Uh, signals that are not predictable for actors that is one of the major yes. causes of uh, instability but so far i think we have not had uh, such uh, signals uh, that that can be sustained for a long period of, of time to detract the actors and again back you said about the consumption it's true that uh, an economy if, we, if consumption is, is so much restricted the economy will not grow uh, in the expected pace and direction and at the end you will miss the taxes that uh, uh, you are expected to, to collect from the growth so it's a prudent way to to balance the two uh, investing but also making sure that the consumption does not suffer because i think part of our growth is driven by consumption if there's limited circulation of um whatever you economists call it, it's the income or earnings, whatever, uh, limiting... You mean money, like money supply? Money supply, limiting the consumption you're talking about. If you have more, you have enough money, you can spend. If you don't, you cut down on certain things. What that, does that mean in terms of the, not micro now, the micro? Micro. Yeah, actually, at the, at the micro level, we have this decision by the agents both as producers but also as consumers so they are making these two decisions almost at the same time and uh, you'd wish you'd wish that uh, the, the consumption pattern of at the micro level at the household level does not suffer because actually that's one of the indicators of poverty uh, when you have a consumption pattern at the, at the household level which is not uh, sustainable and which is not uh, even matching the prescribed standards yes. like three meals a day yes. and you have one meal probably the meal is not well balanced 
and that's quite an indication and of porridge, poverty. It's one meal, then. it's one meal, but not balanced. <laughs> 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 Maybe you come to Blandin because uh, she has done a lot of yeah, that's uh, what research I'm going to go before I come to <laughs> yeah, <laughs> on that. I mean, what is what is poverty really? I mean, do we understand what poverty is? Maskini, maskini, maybe. I mean, you have a Maasai with one, a skuma for that matter, with a thousand heads, uh, cattle, or cattle, or whatever it is. And they're moving around from the north to the south and spoiling uh, the natural, I don't know what you call yeah. the, the eating, the pasture. raising the pasture, and then creating, not really wars, but fight between the the, the farmers and the, the livestock owners. I mean, would you call this poor? I mean, so what exactly is poverty? Because it's, it, it is related to how our economy is growing and the impact of our economic growth towards this. You do your research on that. Uh, um, when we talk about uh, poverty, it's very important to differentiate what we call wants and what we call needs. So normally when we look at poverty, we tend to aim for the basic needs. So whether, <coughs> for instance, we use able uh, household for uh, adult equivalent uh, consumption, meaning like uh, um, if they're below a certain minimum, then we'll call them poor, and this will just be on the income side. But this is just one side. Now, the other side, which is more important, is when we look at the capabilities that have been enhanced or deprived. So here we'll talk about nutrition, we'll talk about education, we'll talk about health, and the things empowering around, the women. yes, oh. em uh, empowering gender, meaning even the youth, <laughs> the men and what you, yes, yes, very, very important. So um, once you look at it that way, uh, sometimes when I speak to my friends here, oh. da, I'm like, Please, just because you don't have your 20,000 right now in your yes. pocket, you can just go to the ATM and get it. Don't pretend you're poor, you're not. Exactly. You're fine. Because you have the ability to go get a job and you can get that 20,000. If there is a job available. If there is a job available, but, <laughs> but <laughs> yet again, because you have the skills, you have different skills that you can apply to get that job. On the assumption that he has a, she or he has acquired skills through work better or whatever. Um, yes, it could be through formal education or it could be right. through the vocational... Even uh, through experience. Uh, vocational uh, training centers. Yes. Now, the challenge you find us, for instance, I'll, I'll, I'd like to bring one. If I was working, let's say I'm a cashew farmer in uh, Tandahimba. Yes. Okay, so I know how to prune a cashew tree, that's uh -huh. a skill. I know how to spray the tree, that's also a you skill. Know how to peel, to I know how to separate, yes, I know the from fruit the from the cut, I, I know how to do that. Those are different skills. If I come to that, yeah. where am I going to apply those skills? If I can't apply them, they become irrelevant. If I come to Da and I am forced to take any kind of work that will require really low skills, just because that my skills now are irrelevant, it beca I become poor right there because I have to start all the way down yeah. up the ladder. So when we're speaking about poverty of this kind, so it's not necessarily you can read and write and write your name, but rather if you come to the market, do you have the skill to make you join, let's say, a telecommunication company? And you'll be like, no. So you have to start somewhere Low right down and look right down there. And the question is not about you starting right down there. How quickly can you move up? If you start right down there and you stay right down there, and we have many people staying right down there, trapped and you are trapped, <laughs> yeah. and that's what we're talking about. And, this is the, and then you create the, a poverty circle, I suppose. Yes, then you end up in this uh, vicious circle right there, because it becomes very difficult, even if you, become, you have a family. Since you can't provide for yourself, it means you cannot also provide for your child. And not only will it be like one meal, but is it balanced, or would you opt for the not so nutritious meals? If you go for the health center, would you like to go to a really health center and see a doctor? Or would you just want to go to a dispensary where there is, you know, some uh, medical attendant very who basic. will, yeah, very basic. So for you, or you'll be like, no, I think I have a headache. Let me just have a, a painkiller. There's a huge difference. And there is a 
big, uh, a big uh, uh, vicious cycle there. Now, breaking that one will be the... Yeah. Yeah. Professor Semboja. Yeah. Um, <coughs> the micro macroeconomic um, environment has been referred to here and there. Uh, in your view, do you think there are possibilities that this environment could change for better or for worse? Well, I mean, uh, currently the environment is stable. Yes. Um, what I think it, we have to think is about how to improve that one. And I would like to correct this question when you are raising the issue of domestic. Um, Tanzania is a small country, an open one. Uh, we, are, we, are, we are part and parcel of this global village. Yes. And, and therefore, real by definition, we don't have that what we can call domestic economy. Uh, as a matter of fact, um, those large scale companies operating in Tanzania, the multinationals, they are registered in Tanzania, but they are international companies operating in Tanzania. So I think uh, when we discuss about risks, uh, it, this has to do with the relationship with other trade partners and the way we improve our social economic activities. I think at the moment um, we will we'll be talking about um, not really about poverty. I'm, I'm, I'm not, I don't like this idea of talking about poverty and I hope even the poor <laughs> they, they have changed that one and uh, even for Kenya they, have, they, they know that that was wrong to think that these countries Poor, poor, poor. We have resources, and therefore we can't think about uh, poverty reduction, but optimal utilization of the resources which we have. So, what what matters here, I think, uh, uh, currently this government, I think it's the first for many years that uh, they are focusing on development expenditures, and uh, they are using our own resources mm -hmm. to develop, to invest. And I think this is one of the reasons why we have to explain to the people that um, what the government now is doing is to restrict current, recurrent, the current, recurrent expenditure with the anticipation that we'll be able to invest in those areas which they're not only productive, because when you talk about the energy sector, it's a pre-request for industrialization. Yeah. Uh, when you talk about investment in education, in health sector, all these are very, very important to, to create a, a very good uh, economic infrastructure, which would be very important for industrialization. Now, industrialization cannot happen in Tanzania because it takes time we have to move from the modern agriculture because the, the current agriculture which we are having is as she was talking about you have 70 percent of the population producing only 30 percent so we, we really to have to modernize it to transform it and as the president was talking last time i think he was in Manza, he was saying that you cannot industrialize without having a modern or commercial agriculture sector now these sectors depend very much on how the government is going to move. Now I think, uh, I know the government is doing enough in terms of controlling its own expenditure activities and it's raising and it's fighting to find different sources of financing. I think one of the sources of financing for the tax revenues, but tax revenues are not the only when you have uh, a, a resource-based country. Tanzania is a resource-based country. Yes. Uh, once you say Tanzania is a resource-based country, it means that you never develop your country unless your own nationals, the private national sector, the Tanzanians themselves, to have the capacity to own and to manage these economic activities in the mining, in the forest, in the fishing. In oil and gas. Oil and gas, you see, in one way or another. But uh, I think more important 
is to understand the role of the government now. Now I think the role of the government, this is a little bit different from the previous thinking of the World Bank that the government has to be to have the hands off, you see, mm -hmm. not to, 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 to engage in the productive activities. Uh, we have to understand it, that was the wrong thinking. I think what is wrong is uh, for the government to interfere either political or administratively. Okay. But uh, the government can still own. Uh, look here, all these big oil companies, Petrobras is a national. Okay, Start Oil is a national. So I think to be a government is not something that you cannot do it with it. So I think for the case of Tanzania, uh, our current government, if we put ourselves into proper perspective to understand our capacities uh, to manage these resources. Because I do not believe that uh, allowing foreigners, private foreigners, to come in Tanzania to invest and extract those minerals and for us to depend on taxes as a way out of All poverty, right. that's All not right. possible. Okay, Professor, I'm, I'm too timely. It's sudden time is is, is, is is being limited now and there are a few questions which I wanted us to discuss but very quickly maybe I don't have to touch the question of the uh, the currency but it stabilizes and gets stronger whatever uh, let's go very quickly to the inflation rate all right uh, people are saying whilst inflation as uh, Bureau of Statistics figures you, you should recently is 5% or 5.1%. 5.1. 5.1. But many people are saying, but they don't feel it in their pocket. What will be the difference? Well, yeah, thank you. Inflation is going down, but uh, yeah. people are not feeling it at all because you you, you will go to the same shop, isn't it? And yeah. Pemba shop or to supermarket. These days people go to supermarket. Exactly. So very quickly. Yeah, yeah. very quickly on that uh, inflation. You know, inflation is the rate of change of price level. Uh, the the price move, let's say, 100 bucks to 110, you have a 10% there. Or 100 to 105, that's a 5%. In, that's a rate of change of price level. But uh, talking of cost of living, uh, one is trying to measure how many goods and services one can acquire using a thousand shillings. This, these are two, well, are more or less the same, but... Uh, uh, what, what, what I can explain uh, in a simple term is that uh, when you see inflation going down, yes. it doesn't mean the price has going gone down. negative. No, no. no. <laughs> that's different. It's a slowdown in the rate of increase in price level. Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But so then that's, in the that's past, the let me cut you short because the time it seems to be running out. In the past, I heard people saying you could survive with the 500 shillings. Ordinary people are saying, but now you can't survive with only the thousand shillings. So, is it because the price of the basic commodities has gone up? And on the other hand, these commodities, you know, do contribute to the either lowering of the inflation or increasing the inflation rate. So, I mean, yeah. people need to understand. Exactly. Uh, indeed, the price, yeah, we, we all agree that price has been. Uh, increasing the price level in general and that's the mandate that uh, the central bank has to control the rate of change of the price level to at least to put a level of uh, inflation that that will steer up the developments of our economy without causing the firms running into losses etc uh, and I think uh, we, we have done we have done our level best coming from 19.8% in 2011 Double, now, digit double digit to single digit. Uh, that's a, it's a significant improvement to that. In the, and then I believe uh, improvement of uh, cost of living. Yeah, yeah, is is still a challenge. But uh, yeah. Okay. So uh, our last question is going to be: What are some of the challenges? But we have already raised one of the challenges. So we'll go this way and then wind up. Pro Pro Professor Simboja, in the same vein, you, you, as I said at the beginning, you were quoted in some of the newspapers saying, "Yes, the inflation rate has gone down, 
uh, people who are arguing that the cost of living has not matched the inflation, inflation that law, which is very high, and you said, you know, that's not true. Is that, is that fair? No, I think what I meant was that um, um, this is just one of the economic indicators. It is true that inflation, the rate of inflation has gone down. Yes. It's controllable, it's stable. It's within the range which is acceptable in Africa, mm -hmm. because in Africa it's between 3 and 7, okay. and Tanzania is in, 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 in the middle in, of the five. Yes. So that's one good indicator. But for those people who are now complaining about the cost of living, they, 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 are, they are very right, considering that they have problems of fi finding right employment for incomes which are needed in the modern life. Because you have to understand that lifestyle has changed. People have changed the demand and they need to do different things as opposed to previously in some years. Now, nowadays people, they think about uh, using mobile and using telephones, smartphones, smartphones and all these kind of things. I'm simply giving those examples. Yes. But uh, I think my major emphasis here is that uh, um, while we talk about the cost, but also we have to discuss measures to improve revenue generations, not only for the government, but also for the individuals in the private sector. That's so that's, that's what we have to think about it. I think I don't have any problem when costs are increasing, okay. because costs, they may be also part of the investments, yes. okay. for example, in the, in the government sectors. But uh, we should look at the productivity now. <coughs> Once you have this one in terms of efficiencies, which is by an increasing, now, coming to that one, and uh, my, 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 my emphasis here is the current leadership. Yeah. Because the current leadership talks about controlling efficiency, making sure that people work in those areas which, where they can make the best of their efforts, maximize. Now, unless we know those areas and, and we, we have good policies, good laws and regulations, and good institutions, at the moment, I have a problem with the institutions and people inside those institutions to support the development of the private sector. All right. Yeah, I'm, I'm sure you have uh, included yeah. as well the challenges you're facing ahead. And exactly. I understand. Let's see very quickly. Uh, so, what will be the challenges, Professor, of um, economic growth anticipation and projections? I think one of the, the challenges we are having is the question of climate change uh, is actually uh, depriving GDP growth by about 1.12 percent and this is one of the areas which is uh, quite challenging in the macro and as well as the micro. Uh, but also secondly uh, we have opportunities that are unfolding now with the sustainable development goals even the five -year, second five year plan that uh, focus should be at the local level and uh, in order to stimulate the local economy so that we have a, a grounding for the macro figures that we, we hear about. Okay. Uh, Dr. Uh, very quickly, a few From the discussion, I think, uh, for me, the biggest one is how to make the informal engagements more productive. The informal sector? I wouldn't want to call it informal sector because they're producing. It's just like they're not producing in such a way they're known in the system. So, yes, yeah, creating an environment to enable them to produce productive things. You think that's a challenge? Yes. It's not happening now. Um, if it's happening, it's at the smallest uh, level. Uh, yeah. You'd rather, you'd rather, this I'd, is I'd rather see. Yeah. All right, well, <laughs> 55 minutes is not uh, yeah. enough time to discuss issues. And maybe, maybe if you allow me one last thing. Although you had your last chance, and yeah. it's going to be my chance. <laughs> Are you sure you will use half a second, not half two? a second indeed? Yeah. Because what, what we have been talking here yes. mainly is the government has summarized it very well in the five year, second five year development plan. Yes. But again, another challenge is the, how we are going to finance all those infrastructure gaps that we are having, how we are going to improve the capacity of our people for human development. That's an area, again, we have to think of it, both government and the private sector in totality, okay. to make sure that this bus really reaches an end for okay. the better And, and I'm sure and Professor Mbodja was a daily... Is this extend or date, I think? Yeah, yeah. but to extend or date, well... Yeah. <laughs>
let, let's leave Another it. Challenge. But at least you do some research to to let us know how we are going to pay for all these uh, um, yeah. development okay. of ghosts and and and. Um, uh, I mean, uh, the ambition to become uh, middle income, is it middle income economy yeah. by 2025, yeah. yeah. which is not very far, yeah. all right? Nine so, years. well, th thank you very much for your, your contribution, ladies and gentlemen. I know we did touch on the question of, uh, of, of, of uh, why we, we why it has become expensive to service your son or date, but I'm sure next time but we'll have another chapter. That uh, one, you, 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 are, you are making me that, that, that talk again, <laughs> <laughs> that one, because... Because I time is over, is it? I know it's over, but uh, <laughs> talking of uh, servicing a debt mm. is something that you have borrowed. Yes. And we have the international threshold on that. Yes. Because looking like a public debt service yes. to revenue yes. is hardly 6.7. Yes. And the international threshold is 22%. Mm. So it's far, far lower still. Okay. Uh, looking of uh, total external debt service to yes. exports of goods and services yes. is 6.5. So we shouldn't worry very much. And the threshold is 25. So we shouldn't worry very much about that. We, right? should, we, should, we should be worry. cautious. But to use the money that you are borrowing yes. wisely <laughs> to benefit okay. our economy. That's, that's well, my, yeah. my panelists, thank you very much for your contribution on this subject. I'm sure the viewers have heard you are very able and excellent contributions, all of you. And uh, it will help to enlighten the viewers on what's going on in terms of uh, economic growth and problems that, we, uh, that go with it, and particularly with the question of um, uh, microeconomic uh, problems leading to poverty and all this. Eh? Thank you very much. Viewers, you have read the views of my panelists here. They're very, very interesting. I'm sure they've enlightened you. The International Monetary Fund and the World Bank, including, of course, the, the Central Bank represented by Nixon here, reports have both favorably spoken about the Tanzanian economic performance and that its growth remains solid. The Bank of Tanzania Financial Stability Monthly, our monthly economic review, review of May 2016 also reports that despite external challenges which we've heard about, brought about by the continued and even global growth and the risk to the domestic microeconomic environment or macroeconomic environment, these micro macroeconomic benchmarks are expected to remain strong, as we yes. heard from a friend here, and the economy growing stronger. Let's hope that will happen. In the meantime, of course, I said this, in the IMF was calling for the government to spend wisely in order to safeguard the prevailing stability. He explained what the IFM was talking about in terms of spending wisely. The recently released date, uh, data by the National Bureau of Statistics indicate that inflation has fallen to 5.1%. Although Tanzanians are complaining that despite that fall, the cost of living is still high. But you heard again Professor Sembodi explaining very well here the relationship between that and the cost of living. Let us hope the government will continue to tighten its physical policy control fundamentals that support continuing growth of the economy and then allow, allow and low inflation. That's all we have for you today. Until next Sunday at 21 hours and on Thursday at 15 hours for the repeat program. On behalf of my panel, Professor Bay, Dr. Blandina Klama, uh, Dixon Ephraim Lema from the, from the Central Bank, Professor Semboja from the University of the Slam, the two of them, and my TBC television center crew. Thank you, viewers, and goodbye.